Uh, our next speaker uh, has been introduced already, uh, Mr. Dunning. You are a thoracic surgeon at uh, James Cook Hospital in Middlesbrough and a strong advocate for, uh, for uh, surgery and non-surgery for Bectus. And uh, you, uh, you know, you've clearly had endorsements from your patients, which must be very, uh, you know, very, very uh, humbling. And uh, we are grateful that you're here to talk to us about uh, management of Bectus from a surgical point of view. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and thank you especially, Lynn, for that fantastic talk, which really is listening to our patients, and it really is something we have to do. So I'm going to take you through uh, the journey of how we came to this crazy situation where we decided to decommission uh, pectus surgery, which had the terrible effect of making everybody who was a doctor, non-specialist, think it was trivial, uh, which is wrong, as you've seen by this book, and is wrong from the patients I see every single day. Um, First, a medical question. Which person feels short of breath uh, in this picture? One of them, you can see a normal-sized heart. The other one, you can see a squashed heart. Now, you'd think that every single person could tell that there's going to be a medical problem and that one of these patients is going to be short of breath. But I tell you now, the one group that cannot tell is NHS England. Uh, and they would not and could not understand the concept that pushing the chest back can squash your heart. Um, so I'll tell you this story. This is Autumn Bradley. Uh, her, when I met her, she was 11 years old. She used to run for the county from 7 till 9 and 10. She started getting more short of breath. She started collapsing. Uh, this is her actual cross-sectional axial scan, uh, and her Haller index was 10. She had one inch between her spine, and you can see her heart is completely displaced across to the side of her chest. Um, I said to her, sure, I will do your operation, but uh, your brother actually has pectus as well and he was two years older let's do him first um, and let get you a little bit older because you know it'd be nice for you to be you know 12 13 so her brother had surgery she came back to have surgery with me in March 2019 it was banned. She couldn't have surgery. She was extremely upset distressed short of breath uh, and I was just gutted for her so these are the patients we see. Um, the milder patients, get them braced, get them vacuum bell, use those such easy treatments uh, to avoid surgery. I wish Autumn had had this at the age of 10, but she didn't, or this patient had had it at the age of 10, but they didn't. So we're talking about these severe people that get missed. And yes, this is this terrible, disgraceful document. So a little bit of background on this document uh, that said that, uh, that basically this is a boob job for boys and that we shouldn't commission it. Um, what were they doing? Well, NHS England were trying to have a bonfire of surgical treatments. They, they created um, a group uh, to, to look at 200 different things on the NHS that they tried to get off the NHS. Uh, the group that led the pectus one were a group of cancer surgeons, uh, none of whom had ever seen a single pectus patient. Um, they were quite short of time, so they farmed it out to a company called Turnkey that was actually owned by Deloitte's uh, a management consultants. Uh, they reviewed only 12 papers uh, and they concluded there was no evidence. Uh, they were actually taken to judicial review. It was upheld because they weren't doing full systematic reviews. They were doing shortcut reviews for the most important reviews you could do that was changing policy. So the judge said do them all again. They were running out of time. Uh, to, they couldn't afford Deloitte's so they set up their own group uh, called uh, Solutions for Public Health. They didn't have enough time so they only reviewed six papers uh, and again said uh, surgery doesn't benefit. Now the really strange thing is they also said robotic lung surgery should not be commissioned in Britain, but I did a case yesterday. So while I can ignore robotic lung surgery is not committed today, right now in England, and I can still do it, we were all written letters and told we couldn't do pectus and we had to stop straight away. I actually still remember the day I brought Autumn's family into my room and said, that operation you've been waiting for for two years I cannot do. You know, they did cry, they had tears, you know, it was a really sad day. Um, what else did they do? They rejected the NICE guidelines that says surgery is safe and beneficial uh, for pectus patients uh, uh, because it was outside the time frame of their literature search. They rejected four of the five stakeholders that said there are subgroups that have physical uh, impairment. Uh, they actually, when you look at their search strategy, they actually didn't search for, for papers that showed cardiovascular change. They actually didn't even look at the papers. So it's not that they looked at the evidence and rejected 
admitted it, they didn't look at the evidence. So that's why they made this mistake. They're all qualitative life studies, and that's how they came to the wrong decision. So we fought back. With Autumn Bradley, uh, we went to Simon Clark MP. Uh, we got quite a lot of publicity from it, uh, and she literally couldn't go up the stairs. And uh, we had a Westminster Hall debate, 400 yards from here, uh, and, uh, and in Parliament, they said, go and look at the commissioning again. So we reset it up, and they redid it, and boy, were NHS England pissed off with me. Uh, so they tried extremely hard uh, to not commission it. There was a brand new paper out that was really high quality, had 130 patients before and after surgery. They had CPEX uh, performed there, showed that with a, uh, a p-value of you've got less than a one in a thousand chance that this is wrong, uh, proved that your VO2 max objectively got better, they rejected this paper uh, and said we're not even going to add it in our literature review. So next, what did we do about it? Well, with Lynn and with a huge group of patients mainly, uh, we got together in the Royal College of Surgeons in England to say this is wrong, this must change, we do have physical symptoms. Um, we brought this book out, we publicised it and gratifyingly, we brought a lady called Fiona Marley from NHS England. She was so affected uh, by that, uh, that uh, session that she allowed us to go through something called urgent clinical commissioning. She said, find us some papers that show really harm patients. Paper, patients. So I showed them 25 uh, case reports of these horrific patients. And they said, no, no, we only want to read three. So they're only allowed to read three. They can't read 20 patients. So based on three papers, uh, we opened up commissioning. Um, but at the moment, you're allowed to get surgery if you're having arrhythmias because of your terrible PE, you have collapse or nearly collapse with your PE, um, or you have massive compression. So these are really, really super restrictive uh, guidance. And really, uh, there are still 95% of patients that have shortness of breath, that have symptoms, that are in that book, that still cannot uh, get surgery. So this is the, the tip of the tip of the iceberg that we can now open up to surgery. So it's still unacceptable, in my opinion. So we've got this clinical commissioning. What does it say? It says, if somebody has pectus, they must be investigated for the cause of shortness of breath. It says, NHS England says on the NHS, you should do a CT thorax, lung function, echocardiogram. But most importantly, you need a cardiopulmonary exercise test. That is the sensitive test whereby we can see if there's cardiac or ventilatory restriction. And it's your NHS right to have that. And that should be available all over England. Um, uh, and this is commissioned. And we're trying to get the word out because people don't know about this pathway. We're still receiving lots of things saying, oh, I was turned away. I was told it can't cause shortness of breath, which is incorrect. We have a national MDT. It meets every other week on Teams. It's headed by, uh, by Bart's. Uh, Bijal Pandya is a consultant pe congenital cardiologist that runs it. We've got respiratory physicians. Uh, we've got Gillian Wallace, who's here today, on the pectus, who runs the CPEX. And we've got some brilliant brilliant people uh, on this that will then tell you, do we think your patient has shortness of breath due to the pectus? So you, as a respiratory physician, don't have to do any clever thoughts. You can say, I'll get the four tests, I'll send them to the pectus MDT, and they will tell us whether shortness of breath is the cause of my patients, uh, whether it's caused by pectus. So do send it in. You can contact me. Uh, you can contact them. Not a problem. So we only have one centre in the whole country. That's not great for my patients up in Newcastle uh, and around the country. So, so there has been a call out for a second centre. Um, but we have been doing a lot of other things. The rest of the world is horrified by what we've done to our patients in England. Uh, in America, in Turkey, uh, in, in Syria, I've had a, a surgeon who can do pectus surgery on people who are short of breath. He says, what are you doing to your patients in England? They're horrified uh, that we uh, are, are denying treatment to people who are short of breath. So we got together with a load of national societies and overseas societies to provide a comprehensive guideline in best practice in pectus care. Uh, um, we summarised the literature properly. Um, we summarised the nine papers of 498 patients that had uh, before and after CPEXs, before and after surgery, uh, that all had improved CPEXs, showing conclusively that surgery does improve your breathing. 
Um, we're coming up with guidelines. The guidelines say what you should do. It says you need the four key tests, echo, lung function, CT, thorax, and a CPEX. Um, and um, based on that, we can make decisions about your patient. It talks about psychology. The really sad thing is I have not got NHS England to talk about the psychological benefits of surgery because they are massive. Uh, you can see in those videos the confidence that Ellie has. I see it every single day. It's really sad that they will not even consider um, any interventions uh, just for psychological improvement. Um, we talk about the vacuum bell, its great benefits, bracing its benefits, uh, the severe pathways. Uh, we recommend anyone with pectus should at least have an echo. So the marfans.org society, um, led by Anne Child, says that anybody with pectus should have an echo just to check that they don't have a dilated aorta. Um, and also we do an eye, an eye test with the ophthalmic. Uh, so if you haven't got anterior lens dislocation, you haven't got a dilated aorta, you've excluded pretty much marfans uh, and that, that's all you need to do. But you, but you shouldn't do nothing when you see a pectus. You should exclude Marfans. Um, and we talk about how you do your operation safety, safely. And remember, NICE says it's a safe operation. And uh, we even have best practice in analgesia. We've got some great new techniques for analgesia called cryoanalgesia, knock out your intercostal nerves with, with ice for about th two to six months. So it's now no longer a severely painful operation. It's not a huge mutilating operation that you do see on the, on the internet. You know, it is uh, an operation that is, is good and careful and well performed in the UK. Um, and we're going to audit ourselves and we're going to set up a lot uh, to make sure we're doing the best surgery in, in uh, that is possible. So we, have, uh, we are publishing the best practice guidelines in our European journal, but what else uh, do we want to do? Uh, well, we were very frustrated that only the pinnacle of the pinnacle can get surgery if you're literally collapsing like Mia Shawas, who still hasn't had our operation. Um, so, so we said, how can we persuade you? And NHS England said, do a trial. So they put out a call for a trial, um, and, uh, and we have uh, put in for it. So this is the restore trial. Um, so we submitted that we would like to take 200 patients and we would like to randomize them. So you have to have severe uh, pectus on your Haller index, more than 3.25, and you have to have any physical symptoms. You know, I'm more short of breath than my peers. I feel short of breath when I jog. Uh, and then you're in the trial. We will randomize you to surgery quickly, within three months, or surgery a year later. We think it's very cruel to say to a patient that you're randomised to no surgery and you have to sign a document that you won't get it privately for three years, uh, which was suggested. But we'll have them one year apart, we'll do CPEX preoperatively, and then we'll do it every year postoperatively for three years. But the primary outcome measure is a patient-reported quality of life. Can we make your quality of life better? And that's what's most important to patients. So there'll be 200 patients in this. Uh, they will all get surgery eventually, early or late. And then there's going to be a third arm for the people accepted by the national MDT, because who would, ex who would want to be randomised for a year in the future who's already been accepted by the MDT? So in total, we're going to have 300 patients having NUS surgery. All of those are going to have a CPEX beforehand and then for every year for three years afterwards. You're going to have 900 CPEXs in this patients, and we are going to find out the true answer of will we make patients better. We'll also have five quality of life questionnaires and psychological questionnaires, so we will answer the question of do people get better psychologically as well as physically. We have a huge group, uh, I call them the Galacticos, uh, who are helping with this study. We're going to have 10 centres in the country uh, and and uh, the really great thing is that, uh, that three weeks ago, uh, we were delighted to, to say that we got successful funding. It's now a £1.9 million uh, successful bid. This will start in three months' time. Uh, and of course, uh, we will be the second national centre as well. And the key thing about the Northern National Centre is we're going to have paediatrics with us as well. So, um, so we've come a huge distance to get remotely as close as the Glasgow service, which is the best in the country. Um, this, I'm pleased to say, uh, is, is a great uh, step forward. Um, I do just have enough time to gore you all out uh, by showing you a video. And I thought, you know, I'm a surgeon. Uh, I, I pretty much should show a little video of the operation because uh, a lot of people are like, this is the terrible worst thing in the world. Now, people say it's next to some terrible, awful structures. Well, I'm a heart and lung surgeon. I personally think I go miles away from the heart. So that's, I have a camera in the chest, and I'm having a look, and I'm miles 
away from the damn thing. Uh, so basically, I, uh, I'm going to put this bar in, I bend the bar, I make a two centimetre incision either side, and then under camera vision, I'm going to pass this bar underneath the chest from one side to the other, and then I basically flip it, and the, and the chest instantly goes straight back up. When the patient wakes up, they instantly can see uh, the benefit. <laughs> This is like a gentle massage, this operation, where I guide this bar delicately across. Um, oh my God, you guys are respiratory physicians, aren't you? And look at that, cured. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to have that? Um, uh, you'll be pleased to hear that this is under general anaesthetic. This, <laughs> this isn't done under acupuncture. And, uh, uh, and, and there it is, gently put in place. I can tell you're all converts to the gentle surgery uh, that I offer. Uh, but actually, it is a very successful technique. It brings people's breathing back. And these are all patients four days after surgery. And these are people that have had their operations. Uh, and so I do believe for the right people, it's the right answer. This is Autumn Bradley. Uh, this is her on her on her last day at school, uh, and so please do look out for anyone that's short of breath. Please do just refer them to expert centres, uh, and we'll look after them as best we can. Thank you very much. You silenced the audience with that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I sold the operation very well, did I? <laughs> No, fantastic. Uh, thank, thank you very much. So, uh, if I get this right, uh, you're advocating that everybody has an echo, irrespective whether they've got a marfanoid habitus or not, uh, to see whether the uh, pectus is impacting the right ventricle or... Yes, yeah, so Anne Child, who's chair of, uh, of Myasthenia Doc Order and a consultant clinical geneticist and has been in, the, in Marfans for th over 30 years and uh, has, was on our panel and she wrote the guideline that said, uh, you know, pectus is one minor criteria on the modified Gent criteria, but, but if you get an echo, then you literally just put that to bed uh, if they haven't got a dilated aortic root and they haven't got a history of anterior land dislocation, then you can at least put that to bed. But she is just absolutely shocked by the number of times she's had referrals in people that, uh, that came with simple pectus, oh, it's a bit dilated, and then suddenly that sets it off. And they will do a genetic test for anyone who's got a dilated aortic root, and that's how they find their patients. It really is amazing how normal uh, some Marfan's patients look, uh, and all for a simple test. The, the reason we do an echo is not to look at compressed hearts. It's very rare that you'll see on an echo a compressed heart from pectus. When you lie flat and slightly to the left to have your echo, the heart pops out from under your pectus, so people are often very falsely reassured. Oh, the heart was normal on an echo. You, I don't know why you're short of breath. The echo is not to look for shortness of breath. It's mainly to exclude Marfan's. Thank you. And is that with children as well? You still would... Yeah, anyone who's, who's got pectus should just have an echo. That's going to be our guideline. And, uh, and that is just because it's quick and easy and because it's, it's so that we don't miss Marfan's patients. Hi, that was fabulous. Um, I'm Cathy, I'm a physio. Uh, I'm just interested to know, uh, like it blows my mind that you can go through that as a surgical procedure and four days later be like <laughs> up and away. Do you see that they get post-op respiratory complications often or do they have like a really robust post-op physiotherapy kind of intervention routinely? How does that work? Uh, well, you're the person I most love for my patients, because if you don't get up and about, uh, you're going to get respiratory complications. Actually, Autumn Bradley was put on a paediatric ward, and she was sat in bed for three days, and she got a respiratory complication, because she wasn't sat out and stood up and got moving, which is so, so vital. So um, we now routinely do this cryo to, to really numb the front of your chest, but day one, you're up and out and about. So yeah, you're totally right. You guys are, are my heroes. And do they need much, do they get a problem with post-op atelectasis and stuff, do they need much positive pressure kind of uh, treatment or are they generally just... The up best and thing's up and about. So, so in America, there are some people going home day two, we stay till day four, uh, but you know, they're, usually, they're pretty fit people otherwise. So, so we, we just collapse the lungs very briefly. Uh, we don't, so so we, getting them up and about is the answer. And, and actually, there's a really important longer term thing that we've got to do. We've got to get them exercising again. Often, as has been said in some of these talks, they're gamers, not athletes, uh, and they're reclusive and they're introverted and we've really got to spend much more time in the, in the six weeks to a year to two years saying, come on, let's get out, let's get the full benefit of this for you to get your energy back because they've lost a lot of muscle bulk. You know, they've, they have got a lot that they've not been doing. 
Great, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, may, may I ask you another question? Uh, I think we asked that question of Ashley as well. Where uh, the chest wall deformity is secondary to a condition, not Marfan's, for example, cardiac surgery when they were younger, uh, what's the, uh, sh uh, do, do we follow the same pathway there or is a surgical intervention going to be beneficial for the, uh, for the chest wall component of, uh, of that? So it's quite rare to do an operation after cardiac surgery. I've done three, um, and, uh, and also it's difficult to delineate out the shortness of breath sometimes, but the three people I've done, it was for severe psychological harm. They really hated the look of it, uh, and so you don't ever want to go inside the chest because the heart's stuck on the back. So actually, for the ones with severe psychological harm, we've done a pectus implant. So you can basically put a quite firm implant over the front, uh, and it looks absolutely perfect afterwards. And actually, it's really safe. You're out in two days. It's a great, great treatment for people who are psychologically harmed who are not short of breath. And actually, it's completely not commissioned. Uh, but, but actually, it's a brilliant, very, very minimally invasive alternative uh, and, and has been very successful uh, in those patients. Thank you. Shiraz. Thanks very much for your presentation. Um, I'm uh, Dr. Shiraz Khan. I'm a consultant pediatrician from Hull. Um, is there any pattern in echocardiography for with the severe pectus excavatum who have got right ventricular compression? And follow up if there is any study or any theoretical risk of pulmonary hypertension post-surgery? Uh, yeah, so really good question. So in, in our pectus MDT, where we're seeing the very most severe in the country, uh, some of the echoes we are seeing, uh, right atrial compression, right ventricular compression, compression of the tricuspid valve as well. Uh, but they really, really are the very most severe cases. I haven't yet seen anyone that's got post-op pulmonary hypertension, uh, but, but occasionally we're seeing, but usually the echo findings are the very latest. So Gillian's CPEXs are the most sensitive, and then after that, the really bad ones uh, we see see this compression on the echo. Uh, as I said, we've, we've had a little go at trying to do some stress echo or some sitting up echo or standing echo because it's far better to look at it physiologically, but actually they're just technically really difficult to do because you get some quite bad windows. And then there's even been some American work doing uh, vertical MRI scanning after exercise to try and really sort of characterize whether you can't fill the right ventricle. But so far, it's not been that successful. CPEX really is the best test uh, to try and get a physical number. How about weight? Does it, what sort of impact does it have on, because we were hearing from the testimonials that there can be some problems with swallowing and certain, you know, how, how does it affect that postoperatively? Yeah, so dysphagia is one of the five criteria on the NHS England super severe pathway. But actually, in practice, we've not yet accepted anybody, although we've accepted about 50 people so far. We've not managed to accept anyone through dysphagia because we find it quite difficult to prove because, obviously, you send them to a GI person who says, I can't find a problem, and I don't want to put on a piece of paper that it's due to the pectus. But I've had several patients that have, who were severe who said, I now find it easier to swallow. Mm -hmm. so, so it's really difficult because what you're going to look for so uh, your swallow tests, the, the food goes down, um, there's no strictures, so it's really difficult to prove. Uh, and actually, that's something I hope might come out in the study. Maybe we can just have on our symptom questionnaire that, that maybe in a small number dysphagia uh, gets better. But it's, it's in one of the five guidelines because there were case reports of it being relieved by, by surgery, especially when you imagine there's one centre between sternum and spine. Yeah, your food pipe's there too, isn't it? So. Yeah. But if anyone can come up with a good test for that, I'd be very grateful. One thing we've actually done a couple of times is put a vacuum bell on somebody in a CT scanner and done a CT with it off and on. And it's incredible the, the distance you can pull the sternum forwards. Uh, and, and actually, that we, we haven't yet done that and asked them to swallow. But, you know, that might be a test. You never know. So many things to research. Come and join us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all our speakers, Julian, Ashley, Lynn. Thank you, Joe, and thank you for everybody for their participation. We'll close the session.